Okay, Watchmen of Ephraim. Or Rick. This video is going to deal with something I've wanted to do for a long time, cover the subject of Melchizedek. Who is or was Melchizedek of Genesis 14? This king who was also a high priest of El, the Most High God. He shows up in three places, in Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Uh, first and foremost, if I uh, may, a, a couple of scriptures here or verses to help us with this study. For the law or the Torah or the first five books of Moses having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of these things. And this can be applied, hey, to the earth, to the Garden of Eden, to Adam, to Eve, to the Levitical priesthood, to the common land people, to Moses, to Aaron, to Egypt, to the land of Canaan. So... A shadow of the good things to come, the mysteries of the kingdom are in the Torah. Okay, So we have to believe what God says, or what God says in his word, that the Torah is a shadow of the good things to come. They may get out of that, and here's the boy, Jesus, once again studying the Torah, which is a shadow of the good things to come, which he said, and here another witness, think not that I have come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And concerning this Melchizedek, if you see this picture here, he looks like he's deified, glorified. This picture most likely witnesses a uh, Christophany or a pre-incarnate Jesus or a pre-existing Jesus that was Melchizedek. This is one of the theories concerning uh, this man. The other one is that he's a type, a model, a shadow, a prototype. That's the more correct Um, interpretation for the Torah having a shadow of the good things to come um, in Hebrews hey the book of Hebrews where the third place that this uh, this uh, man shows up that's like that's your confirmation that book right there is your absolute confirmation of typology Hebrews, what is Hebrews about? The supremacy of the Messiah over angels, over Moses. Then he brings in Aaron and the, the Arianic priesthood. And he'll bring in Melchizedek to demonstrate that this priesthood is more superior than the priesthood of Aaron well, I'll say and his sons. But anyways, we'll stick to the subject of this one man, Melchizedek. Hebrews, yeah, confirmation of typology. So um, this here, this picture here was probably the more accurate picture of this man who was king of Salem, Salem and also priest of the most high El. God. So we'll start to get into it a little bit. So why don't I go to Genesis chapter 14 here. And we'll just read verse 17 through 19. This is basically the context where he shows up. Four kings from the east of the land of Canaan invaded the land and defeated five kings of the land of Canaan. And they took Lot as captive, and Abraham 
assembled, and I think he had 318 men. He assembled his men of war, and he went and he defeated those five kings, and he brought back his nephew, Lot. And here this Melchizedek comes out from the city of Salem. I have a map here. You go down the line here. Here's a map of Abraham's day concerning the land of Canaan. Here's the city of Salem. And right about here, this map shows, this map shows whether it's exactly where it happened, where, where Melchizedek blessed Abraham. This valley of Sheva, right here. Okay. Some 2,000 plus years B.C., around 2,000 years B.C. I also have a timeline that I'll, I'll show you. I'll get into a little bit here. Uh, Genesis 14, 17, 19. Let's figure out who this guy is. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that's Abraham, at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Kedor Laomer the, and the kings who were with him, those four kings that came from east of Canaan and defeated these five kings who rebelled and refused to pay tribute to these four kings anymore. In the 13th year, it says they rebelled. That's where the number 13 is linked to rebellion. And what nation has the number 13? Anyways, attached to it. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. King of Salem. He was the priest of God, or El Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. So I'm going to talk a little bit right here. Uh, and then in verse uh, uh, 20, Abraham gave a tenth uh, to him of all. Okay. So this king of Salem, he greeted Abraham. He brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abraham of God Most High. His name wasn't changed to Abraham yet. Possessor of heaven and earth. Who was this man? Well, if you, if you notice, there was no, the, the, one of the theories here, a Christophany, there's no take your shoes off. Uh, the, the, the land which you are stand upon is holy ground. Abraham didn't fall down and worship or pay, even pay homage. Didn't, there, there's nothing, you know, unusual. There's nothing out of the ordinary where this, this, this man Melchizedek is some kind of a divine being or some kind of a divine person even. Uh, as, as many in Christianity believe, and even the Hebrew sages and rabbis in the first century, at the end of the first century, began to kind of, in their rabbinical writings, began to deify this guy. So he's Melchizedek, Melchi, king. Some believe it can be translated my king, uh, Zadok, king of righteousness, and also king of Salem. Again, let me pull up the, the map here. Uh, here we have, in Abraham's day, the, the Jerusalem, this is where Jerusalem is, Jerusalem, it was called Salem. And Abraham, by the way, uh, Abraham is right down here. Adam, all right, first year created, creation to 930. Here's Abraham about uh, 2,008 years after the creation. He's born. And I know before that you had the rebellion or you had Nimrod and that Babylonian re the rebellion where they rebelled uh, 
and try to build the Tower of um, uh, Babel in the Babylon mystery religion uh, existed way back then with Nimrod, Cush. That's where its origins, uh, that's where the origins of the Babylon mystery religion can be traced. But there were still a lot of people who believed in the one true God in Abraham's day. Now there's, uh, there's, there's proof of this. There's a city called Ugarit, an ancient city, where archaeologists have dug up thousands of tablets that it recorded the Canaanite religion. Canaanites were dwelling, were in the land of well, Canaan. Well, makes sense, right? Well, Canaanites were in the land. And at the time of Abraham, they were mostly monotheistic. This city with these thousands of tablets that recorded the, the religion, the actually recorded the evolution of the Canaanite religion, what they believed, they were monotheistic. This man was monotheistic. There, were more, there was more than just Abraham who believed in the one true God. But as time went on, man continued to descend into polytheism. The Canaanites took up the mystery religions, took up Baal worship, Baal, Baal worship, the storm, the rain god, the god of fertility. So they degenerated. Even God told Abraham when he promised to bring them out of Egypt, he said the iniquity of the Amorites is not fully, has not fully come in. So this man here, I mean, this, 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 this man was, he was a Canaanite, this Melchizedek. He believed in the one true God. I've got another picture up here of someone else. Let me just get out of this. Job was living back then in those times. Job was a believer of the one true God. You know, the book of Job is like the oldest book in the Bible. He was a believer of the one true God. So there was more than one person who believed in the one true God at that time. So here, Melchizedek, who was a Canaanite, the Canaanites inhabited Salem at that time. He was king, he was king of Salem, and he was also the priest of the Most High God. And he was a man. All right. There was a degeneration into polytheism, into Baal worship. And these tablets in this city, if I can find it again, Ugarit, Archaeologists have found have proved that they were monotheist at one time. And again, they degenerated into a uh, polytheistic religion. Okay, so this he was a man. He believed in the one true God. And what was unique about him, he was king of Salem, and he was also, he was a king and he was a priest. King of Salem, and he was also a priest of the Most High God. And for whatever reason, this is all that's spoken of this man in Genesis. God most likely inspired Moses to write neither more nor less concerning this man. Concerning the shadow of the 
good things to come. Okay, so we're going to pick it up now in Psalms 110. So this psalm can be divided into two parts. Uh, concerning the Messiah as king and the Messiah, the coming Messiah as priest. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord 14 times in the New Testament, for this scripture is, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength or the scepter of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So here's a messianic psalm talking about the Messiah being a king. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Uh, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn, verse 4, here we go now. Here is the promise of the priesthood. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek or long duration, Olam. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. That's the day of atonement. When the avenger of blood begins to take vengeance on the earth and release the earth from its bondage. And the, uh, the kinsman redeemer takes possession of the title deed. He has the title deed. He takes possession of the earth. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. And there's going to be a lot of He's going to make men more rare than fine gold. Punish the world for its evil. Anyways, you are a priest forever, long duration, Olam, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so what's unique about Melchizedek? Once again, he is both a king and a priest. Something that Aaron obviously never attained. Okay, this is David in the Davidic kingly line. And then you had the sons of Aaron going to be meshed together into one. All right. So let's go to Hebrews now. Mm, let me just go back. Let's pick it up in, just, let's, let's just look at the verses here. Uh, we'll just scroll through Hebrews, uh, where Melchizedek is. I'll probably read all of Hebrews 7. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. Well, there goes your Christophany right there. But it was he who said to him, now, here, here's the thing, here's, when did he become high priest? So if he was pre-existent, he, he would have been a priest continually. Uh, past, present, and future. But there is a time where he, this man, begins his priesthood. When did this happen? On the morrow, after the Sabbath, during the days of unleavened bread or the eighth day, when he rose on that first day of the week or the eighth day or a Sunday, according to the Gregorian calendar, as the wave sheaf offering, he went to heaven. And this is what God said. You are my son. Today I have begotten you from death to life. A full-blown Huio, son of God. So again, I have it here. When we talk about uh, typology, once again, we have the, uh, we're going to have, we're, we're going to go from the Melchizedek priesthood into the Arianic priesthood in Hebrews 8 uh, through 10 is a shadow and type where he enters the heavenlies. Of course, Aaron entered the shadow and copy of the heavenly place and he did it literally. 
And here's the man in white garments. Fulfilling. You are my son. The white hair, the white garments. Today I have begotten you from death to life. A full-blown Helios, son of God. So his priesthood began when... He also says in another place, you are a priest, long duration, quoting verse 4, Psalm 110, according to the order of Melchizedek, or in the likeness of Melchizedek, as we will see. Both King Zadok or excuse me, excuse me, Melchi King and King of... Okay. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Okay, there's Aaron's shadow priesthood and Messiah fulfilling the reality of it. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Yeshua Jesus, now notice, having become high priest, forever or continually or long duration duration according to the order of Melchizedek. Notice, having become high priest. So his priesthood has a beginning. Okay. And it began when he rose from the dead on the morrow after the Sabbath of the eighth day and ascended into heaven. And God glorified him. God was the one who glorified him and gave him that office. All right. Let's go back. Now let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. All right. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. But his, his, he, was the, he was the king of a city. Translated Salem, king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made, now notice, like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Made like the Son of God, not who is the Son of God. Made like, or similar, like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So, the, the writer of Hebrews is, 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 is being, being allegorical here, being figurative here. Nothing was spoken about this man's genealogy in Hebrews. In Genesis 14, nothing, nothing was spoken concerning his genealogy. So he's pulling this. And he's trying to show the superiority of Messiah's priesthood, which began when he was raised from the dead and continues on for the ages. Verse 4, now consider how great this man, now the word inserted in its proper was. Now consider how great this man was. Now he identifies as a man. 
He's not some kind of pre-existing being. Consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, according to the Torah, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the by the better. So he's showing here that this this Melchizedek figuratively was 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 had a better, a higher priesthood than Aaron and his sons. This is what it's all about. These Hebrews, whoever this letter was written to, they were falling back into the law of Moses. As written by Moses, the letter. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So this is again, this is typology, this is figurative. Because he, he said previously, consider in verse 4 how great this man was. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes to Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest, now notice, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek or in the likeness of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being change of necessity, there is also a change of the law or the Torah. That's a great translation there goes now to the Torah of faith. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man is officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek, not that he was or is Melchizedek, Notice, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. When did that endless life begin? When he rose from the dead. His priesthood had a, had a beginning. There arises another priest. It had a beginning. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Both king and priest. For on the one hand there is a nulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the Torah made nothing perfect. I'm going to do a video on that. On the other hand, there is bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And insomuch as he was not made a priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, when did he say it to him? The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of or in the likeness of the order of Melchizedek. Both king and a priest who continues long duration. Continues on. Alright, so he's polling this man. And putting, in, putting it into the book of Hebrews as, you know, this is typology. 
according or in the likeness of the order of Melchizedek. Messiah fulfilled that. He is the priest of the new Jerusalem, which is coming down uh, to the earth. Revelation 21 and 22. By so much more, Yeshua Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, again, a shadow covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever or long duration for the ages, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to say to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Going down to verse 28. For the Torah appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which was when? When he rose from the dead. Another priest, another priest arose when he rose from the dead, which came after the law, appoints the son. Now notice, appoints the son who has been perfected or made complete continually all right so his priesthood had a, a had a beginning all right and he was made like the son of god didn't say that he was or is the son of god okay just comparing the two and the Messiah fulfilling. This. Uh, this king. Who was a Canaanite. Who was a monotheist. Who was a prototype. Who was a model. Of him who would come later. And another priest arising. And his priesthood would begin when he rose from the dead. And is in the likeness of Melchizedek, both king and priest. Not some pre-incarnate being, not some pre-existing being. He was a man. Consider how great this man was. Hebrews is all about typology, shadows, types, allegories. That's what this is about. This is a tough, this is tough. I was taught in the Worldwide Church of God, Herbert Armstrong's teaching, that this was the pre-existing Jesus. It's not. Abraham wasn't the only one who believed in one God back then. All the way back some 2,000 years B.C. 4,000 years ago. Who studied the Torah? Think not that I came to destroy the Torah. I came to fulfill. He came to fulfill what little was written about this king and priest Melchizedek it's the boy Yeshua Jesus laying up the Torah in his inmost being okay so Melchizedek was a man most likely a Canaanite king who was a believer in the one true God Okay, so thank you for your time and thank you for listening.